Now that we've got a good handle on a recursive definition, I want to take a moment to take a breath, reflect back on what we've covered so far, and think about how Goldman has framed this problem in this paper and why. So the first thing I want to look at is the prohibition against epistemic language in the base clause. Why would he do that? The idea here traces back to his claim, I'm going to offer up a theoretical account. I'm going to offer up something that gives me a deeper and more profound understanding of the phenomenon, that explains the phenomenon, doesn't just categorize the phenomenon. So one of the ways in which the justified true belief definitional account of knowledge seems superficial is that it is just a categorization mechanism. It gives us some insight into the nature of knowledge, but mostly it just provides us with a way of deciding whether or not something counts as knowledge in a particular case. A really good theory in physics doesn't just classify things and provide a means to classify things. It helps us to understand how the world unfolds and why it unfolds in the way that it does. And I think this is what Goldman is shooting for. A nice illustration of this point can be seen in Moliere's play, The Imaginary Invalid. In that play, the doctor who's taking care of the invalid says, I will explain to you now why it is that opium puts you to sleep. Opium has a dormative virtue. Oh, well, that's very interesting, says the character. What is it to have a dormative virtue? you that. Oh, it's the property that puts you to sleep. So there's in some sense an explanation there, but the explanation is trivial or vacuous. And so what Alvin, I think, is trying to do here, what epistemologists in general aspire towards, is to come up with an account of knowledge that isn't merely rephrasing knowledge in other epistemic terms, but that allows us to understand it in a way that steps out of that normative framework and helps us to see it in action in everyday life. Now, I think I might be projecting a little bit into what he is trying to do. But ideally, that's what we'd like to do. We want to have an account of knowledge that we can see readily applies to people's ordinary actions so that we can apply the normative framework and we're not forever walled off inside it. We can see how it relates to other kinds of actions described in other ways. What about the use of recursive definitions? Well, I think the same story can be told here. We've been looking at foundationalism and coherence theory. We were talking about Plato. We we're talking about Descartes. We we're looking at all these individual cases. And one of the things that we noticed was there's this idea of transfer of justification through inference, inferential justificational transfer. Boom, boom, boom. I've got a belief. I make an inference to another belief. My first belief was justified. That justification gets transferred via that inference to the next belief. One of the difficulties we see emerge from this is where does the justification come from originally? Where is it that I find the originally justified belief. Now, the foundationalist has the answer. I get to this point at which the beliefs have their own intrinsic justification. They are inherently justified. They justify themselves, things of this nature. So when you think about how that story goes, self-justified, foundational, basic beliefs, those are a base clause. These things are justified. A recursive clause just specifies all the different ways you can extrapolate out from a justified belief in a way that preserves the justification through that extrapolation. And then you have a clause clause which says those are the only beliefs that get justified. So this recursive definition, it has the same general form as an epistemic regress would have moving from the first instance forward. It specifies how once you've got that first case, you can go on in general and do it indefinitely. The big question is, and the question to which we'll turn our attention in the next lecture module, is can the epistemologist put together all the pieces of a recursive definition of justification. We have in the form of foundationalism and coherence theory, a basic roughed out recursive clause. The recursive clause relies upon content relationships between beliefs mediated
communicated through inference. So I've got a justified belief. I make an inference. Say I make a deductive inference. That justified belief is true. The deductive inference guarantees that the next belief must also be true. Since that first belief was justified, that inference transfers the justification via the content relation from my initial belief to the next belief. That's the recursive clause. I apply that for every instance. I can do it for deduction. I can do it for induction. If I've got a justified belief and I make a good inductive inference from that initial belief to a new belief such that the belief is highly likely to be true given the initial belief, then I get that transfer of justification via the content relationships so that my justification from the first belief goes into the second belief. So I've got that recursive clause. What we've been noticing, at least one of the things we've been noticing, is that the initial infusion of justification, where that first justified belief comes from, that seems to be a point of serious contention. Both the foundationalist and the coherence theorists seem to think that justification somehow comes from the content. Somehow the belief is justifying itself so that it can then transfer its justification to other beliefs. At least that's the foundationalist story. For a foundationalist like Descartes, when I get back to those basic beliefs, their truth is just so compelling. Their content manifests itself in a way that makes it clear that they cannot be denied, and hence I'm compelled to believe them. I am justified in my acceptance of them. In fact, that's literally what Descartes means, because when Descartes talks about judgments, he says the judgments that are clear and distinct, that leave no room for doubt, compel my assent. It's not even a choice in Descartes' case. Now, a coherentist like Bonjour looks at those cases and they say, oh no, I get the content part, but the relationship between the content and its truth, its veracity as a description of the world, that has to be inferred from the content and the manifestation that it gives you. And hence, there is no escaping that inferential chain. But of course, that leaves the question of where you get that base clause from. Where does the justification become infused into the system? And as I suggested during the Bonjour lectures, it looks like he doesn't actually have a good answer for that. It looks like his answer seems to be some sort of combination of, well, introspective beliefs are pretty much like basic beliefs, except they're they're inferred, uh, but they're not really, but, but they are inferred and they don't require any other inferences, but everything's inferred. And then I don't actually have to make any inferences for most of these cases because I just need to have a tacit awareness of the availability of that inference, whatever that would amount to. And so it seems as though when we look at this case, we've got this recursive clause, this inferential trend transfer of justification. Of course, we're putting aside the concerns that were raised by Gettier and, and Russell here about whether or not that's unproblematic in all cases. But regardless of that, I still haven't figured out that first part of the puzzle, that base clause, how it was that those initial beliefs are infused with justification. If I look purely at the content of those beliefs, it doesn't seem like there's any obvious story that can be told. The foundationalist story seems to suggest that I just see it. The coherentist story seems to suggest I just somehow infer it without really inferring it. And so we seem at a loggerhead. And this is why we find Goldman looking at these various candidates. Well, what could be a candidate for the beginning of this sequence? What could be a candidate for infusion of justification into the belief system after which content might be able to take over? So hopefully that provides some context that helps us to see what's going on in Alvin's paper through the lens of the issues that we've raised so far in class and allows us to see why it would be that he would frame his paper using this recursive definition structure and how we can understand his consideration and ultimately rejection of those base clauses in preparation for the introduction of his own.